Hi everyone, it's Marco Suiz here. My guest today is phenomenal. He is a voice actor, a voice over artist, and he's award-winning. So please stick around. We have a great conversation for you. You learn a little bit about voiceovers and how we make them and a little bit about the business. This is One Mike Knight, Marco Suiz. See you in a minute. Boom. Welcome to One Mic Night, the podcast that brings you stories of artists and people on their journey, helping to guide, answer questions, and motivate you in life and the business. You already know who I am. It's Marcos Luis, and I'm back. Yes, this is season four. We're coming to an end. 2023 is happening. <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute because this year just flew by. <laughs> but I'm so happy because uh, my guest today, and you guys all know that I get excited when we have actors on the show and people in the business because we can talk shop. My actor today, my, excuse me, my guest today is a voice actor and voiceover artist. He's award winning. His name is Greg Campbell. So please welcome him to the show. How you doing, Greg? Good, good. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out to bring me on your show. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for making the time. We appreciate that. Listen, man, I have questions. Okay. First question is, who is Greg Campbell? Uh, Greg Campbell is a uh, guy who is just a normal guy, but loves to, uh, loves his craft. Um, I um, grew up in Flint, Michigan, um, and uh, got into actually the business of um, sports reporting and producing. I worked at an NBC affiliate up in Michigan back in the 90s, and um, um, that brought me actually to my uh, current home. I live in Tampa, Florida, and so I got, uh, you know, in, in television, the goal is to get into a top 20 market, and um, I was able to reach that goal. And so the late 90s, I came to a new startup. A uh, company called Bay News Nine, and was the sports reporter and producer there for a few years, and um, got out of the business in 2005. TV is a rough business; it's a cutthroat business, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, you know, and and I thought I'd never get back into broadcasting, and um, and then a while back ago, um, you know, people started approaching me about, hey, have you ever done audiobooks? And I never listened to an audiobook. Never thought about going back into broadcasting, and it just kept being pounded and pounded in my, uh, you know, you know, in my attention. Everybody keeps bringing it up to me, so I said, "Well, let me look into this." And so I looked online, looked for coaches, and uh, I was kind of old school, so I didn't want to have a coach online on Zoom or anything like that. So I found a guy that uh, in Sarasota, Florida, who uh, drove down. Um, an hour every weekend. He had his own home studio and he coached me up and uh, the rest has been history. I absolutely love it. This is my calling. I found found my calling late in life, but I found it. So, I love that. I yeah. love that. See, that's how, that's how it's supposed to happen. So first mm -hmm. of all, I want to back it up just a little bit because you said you grew up in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. what, what was that like for you? Uh, it was good. At, you know, Flint, Michigan is one of those cities, just like Detroit, Saginaw, Michigan, was really hit hard by the auto industry leaving. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, when you think of those cities right now, people think of them as pretty much almost like ghost towns because uh, after that industry left, it really didn't, you know, hasn't grown with a new industry to help with jobs and things like that. And so the, for example, um, 
my dad had a uh, little small um, dictionary. And at the end of that dictionary, it showed the, the um, population of the city of Detroit. And this was like in the early 70s. Detroit was one and a half million people at that time. Flint was almost 200,000. And now Detroit is like 700,000 people, almost 600,000. And Flint, my hometown, is under 100,000. So, wow. you know, you, you see how big of a difference was because my family, my dad, my uncle, and an older brother all worked in the factories. So, I mean, there was, you know, those cities were, so my growing up as a kid, you know, it was great at the time. Mm -hmm. But when the auto industry died in the early 80s, I mean, it just, you know, everything just went. And everything so, left. Absolutely. I know. I, I know exactly what you mean. I uh, I grew up in the Pennsylvania area in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and the steel industry, you know, yep. left in the 80s. So Absolutely. once that happened, you know, you see a decline in everything and it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a depressed area. People left, you mm -hmm. know, people losing their homes, people struggling to make ends meet. Absolutely. So it, the city had a, a definite different feel to it after that happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, people, when I talk about my hometown, you know, there's a lot of great memories. There's a lot of great memories from Detroit and, you know, people uh, still to this day think of us as Motown. I'm talking about Motown records and, and all that. Those, those memories for somebody of my age group is still fresh in my mind. And so the positive things I always think of first, um, but, you know, un unfortunately with that legacy and what's happened in the last 35, 40 years, people kind of think of those cities as, you know, um, you know, kind of de decayed cities, but I don't think of that. And, you know, I think of my hometown, I get back there every now and then. I still have siblings that live there mm -hmm. and, um, you know, good friends that I grew up with, um, you know, on my, on my street. And so I got back about two years ago and it was great to see everybody. But, um, so that was my childhood growing up there, growing up in that cold weather, walking to school in that <laughs> cold weather. <laughs> I've heard stories. I've heard stories <laughs> about that cold weather. Absolutely. Growing up Absolutely. as a child, were you was it were you in the arts or were you thinking about doing anything in radio or anybody in your family that encouraged that? My my family was very sports oriented. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, all of us participated in sports. That was our thing. When it came to uh you know, summertime, you know, we didn't take vacations pretty much. I mean, it was, we were playing sports. We were playing baseball. We were doing all that. My sister played, uh, everybody, all the kids played um, sports. So I was pretty much an athlete and um, played football and, you know, went to college for that and all that. So it was, it was pretty much, that's what my thing was. I really, the irony of me in broadcasting is this, um, and I always think about this, is that um, when I got in the eighth grade, my voice changed. Mm. I had a very high <laughs> high voice when I was a little kid. Right. And um, my voice changed. And it's just ir irony of life sometimes, you know. I think God plays tricks on us or has a, a good sense of humor because um, when I grew up as a kid, um, I was really into sports and I love watching NFL films and they had this great, uh, narrator, John Facenda had this voice of God. And, um, I used to watch it and my mother would be in the kitchen, um, uh, and she would hear his voice and she would say, oh my goodness, he has such a great voice. And just the irony of that, that I would be doing this all these years later and my mother's passed on now, but I know she would probably be laughing at the fact that That's we funny. had this discussion and her, you know, son voice changed <laughs> of this deep voice. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing narration at that time. I never even thought narration would be something that you can make a living out of. And so, and he was kind of like um, an idol of mine along with, you know, of course, Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones but um, I got in it, uh, got into broadcasting because people was, you know, about my voice. And then, um, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's why I do this. I really, I enjoy it, you know, but uh, people have really pushed me into doing it. That's interesting because you have a very unique voice. And when I think of your voice, you have a very soulful, deep, you know, voice, commanding mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. But I can also hear the 
you know, inflections that you have yep. that you can take the words and caress them. Yep. And you could probably, you could sell me anything, sell yep. anybody anything. I appreciate that. And that's yeah. that's what the difference is. I know yeah. growing up, we all used, you know, if you listen to Soul Train, Don mm -hmm. Cornelius, that voice was <laughs> always, we will Absolutely. never forget that voice. Absolutely. So those kind of people. Did you ever walk around the house and just kind of imitate the the sportscasters? Yeah, I Voice did. I did. You know, yeah. I I I did a lot. And um, you know, or even driving in the car, you know, do it uh there a lot. And so, I mean, because for me, getting into broadcasting and uh when I was working in television, writing was a big thing for me. So I when I get a script and I don't hear too it's just funny, I think coming from that industry over into uh narration. Um, I don't hear too many other uh, voice actors who got got into the business outside of broadcasting, say, you know, writing. The, when I see a good script, it blows me away or something like that. But for me, there's been a couple of um, um, scripts where I've got them and I said, this is perfect for me. I'm going to knock this out. I mean, hmm. it's just it's just some some writing. Um, there was a. Um, uh, a tease I had to do for a um, soccer game uh, between um, there was two schools on the West Coast and it was going to air on um, national TV on Fox and um, I think it was Pepperdine and like uh, Cal State Bulletin, some one of those. And um, the first couple of words in the script was, what does heaven look like? And I was just like, I got this. Uh, <laughs> you wow. know what I mean? It was just yeah, that, yeah. That word, the wording there. And I was looking at the script and I was like, I don't want to do this. And so I ended up, I auditioned for it and I ended up getting it. And um, um, so there's those instances where good writing really makes me like, you know, it makes me very excited. What's your, um, what's your technique when you're doing the, the voice acting? Say someone gives you a script. What do you, when you look at the script, what do you do? Do you, envision the word mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. do it with your voice how do you yeah. how do you what do you do you know it's kind of a years of training and and um and then the feel of learning words and the meaning of what the kind of translating you kind of translate what the author or whoever the writer is is trying to convey um like sometimes if it's commercial for example if i'm we do a live uh, a read, you know, they could be in a studio and I'm at home in my studio and um, they could have, typically if it's like a commercial or something like that, there's the producer in there, there's a representative of the product in there and the audio person. Mm -hmm. And so those two, like I'll go over the script and they will say to me, well, I want you to punch this word or I want you to say it this way. So sometimes you get coaching from individuals oh, okay. on their product but a lot of times i do do the voiceover without that and i just look at words and you know kind of translate what i think they're trying to convey in this you know they'll give you a general idea they'll say they want it either upbeat or they want it to be uh soft or they want it to be warm and i'll you know give them that and then i'll send it on to them and if they they're fine with it then they're good to go. If not, then they'll say, hey, Greg, can you, you know, read it this way? So okay. that's how it pretty much is done. How has the process changed since uh, the pandemic? Because I know over the pandemic, you can't, you obviously couldn't, there wasn't much work, but if you did right. do work, it's it's certainly changed. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, you know, it was a difficult time because a lot of production studios was down, you mm -hmm. know, because of the pand pandemic. And a lot of times it uh, with voice actors, you know, you get relationships with, I mean, we kind of work with each other. I mean, they want voice actors and um, vice versa. That's how we get work is through production companies. And when those were down, that did, you know, play a role that did hurt. Absolutely. Because um, they couldn't have a whole lot of people in the studio. They couldn't, you know, go out and shoot commercials and things like that. Um, so it did definitely hurt. So, uh, but now things have picked back up again, of course, in the last year and a half. Um, but it was it was tough there, absolutely. You still find yourself? Um, is it more of submission of your your work, your audio uh, via email now for the audition part of it? 
or do you actually go to your, I don't know if you have an agent or not. Yeah, I have agents. agents. Okay. I do have agents and they send me work from time, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the year. Um, and I also, um, you know, with just like any business with the voice acting business, you, it's your business. Right. So you have to, you know, seek, um, you know, clients. And right. so, you know, I go out and establish relationships, uh, with, you know, production companies, um, uh, with creative producers, um, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of, um, I work with a company that does marketing for me and they, you know, when I've established a relationship with the production company, that's, that's awesome because, you know, if they bring in work, they're going to consider me. So that's pretty much how it works. And then audiobooks, I work with, you know, several companies, um, that send in work to me, you know, in, in that regard. So absolutely. I like that. I want to, two things I want to say. One, growing up, you, you, you kind of mentioned this, was there anybody that you looked to that looked like you that could do this work? And two, how now, what we, what we just said, you have to treat this as a business. Like everything you do, you're 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 the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's kind of changed um, from <laughs> the way yeah, it was. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I you know I looked at looked up to the people. Everybody knew James Earl Jones. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we. Star Wars and everything, you know, definitely looked up to his voice. He was one of the first. And then when Morgan Freeman started, mm -hmm. you know, I was a little kid. He was on the electric company. Right. But, yeah. Uh, he wasn't doing that sort of thing. When he got into acting, um, you know, he blew people away just how good of an actor he was. But um, when he started doing other things, you know, voiceover work and hearing them on commercials, I was just, you know, amazed by him. And so, um, yeah. So, and, and then there's a guy who worked in the industry and I met him, his name is Dave Benoy. He did a lot of, he's in his sixties and uh, I met him at the voiceover convention back in 2018. And uh, he did a lot of work. Um, you know, one of the things with the industry at the time, um, there weren't very many black people hired. And if they were hired, they were hired because of you know, it had to be a black show or something like that. He did a lot of work uh, for promos for black shows. Like uh, he told me he did, you know, Sister, Sister uh, back in the 90s. You know, he said they that was pretty much the work that he was getting is if it was anything black related. Um, and so he he's kind of a pioneer in the business as well. He's been in the industry for many, many years and he is extremely talented. He does so many voices for um, uh, um, video games and things mm. like that. Great guy. And uh, so he he was somebody that, um, you know, I looked up to and, um, um, you know, and in the industry. And uh, I, when I met him, I uh, said that to him and it kind of brought him to tears. I was just like, you know, you know, I said, but yeah, hey, you know, you were really important because there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, black faces out there. And he was one of the pioneers. Right. Do you feel like the video games and the AI has opened up a lot more avenues or yeah, either one has hurt um, the business a bit, a bit? AI is kind of, um, um, there's that fear factor with, you know, being able to replace people. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things in the industry that's getting around is that, you know, will AI be taking jobs away and you know most people don't think so i mean they feel like they want a, a human to work with and we'll see on that i mean that's something that yeah you don't want to happen because um you know there's so many people's craft um but um you know game yeah video games i i've never done one but uh, i would love to do one i mean it's it's it is huge it's a yeah. huge billion dollar huge industry, industry. Absolutely. You have Absolutely. no idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there a union for the voiceovers or do you? Yes. Is yes. That, it's the Screen Actors it? Union. Screen Actors Guild? So, yep, okay. Yeah. So it's just, um, I I haven't gotten into the union yet. Um, people have been telling me you need to get into the union. And uh, uh, one of, actually one of my um, agents out of New York was saying that to me when I first joined with them. And I was mm -hmm. like, uh, 
I'll see. <laughs> so yeah, I, I do. What, you know. Yeah. What do you What do you think about that? Let's Let's talk about that for a second because I'm part of the Screen Actors Guild as well. So what do you think about the Screen Actors Guild in terms of what you're doing and where you are in your career right now? Um, you know, I, I think that um, <clears throat> um, it's about the, um, you know, the non-union jobs and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having that availability and uh, with voiceover work, um, you know, still be able to, to have that freedom to, you know, get the jobs that you want to go for. Um, and I, you know, and I think there's a lot of um, pros and cons, and I think that in our industry, um, a lot of um, word of mouth out there that is, it's, um, you know, I don't talk to too many people that's in the industry that's in the in the union, right? So because um, they want that freedom to be able to do the non non union jobs, so. Uh, but it's I mean, something I still need to, you know, just continue to look at more and possibility the possibilities there because I, I hear, you know, very good things. I, you know, people who are voice actors that are in the union have nothing mm -hmm. but positive things to say. Right. So, you know, I need to, you know, look at that and because <laughs> they have a lot of positive things to say. Yeah. But I think it's just kind of, um, you know, two things there that people, you hear the pros and cons on both sides. Yeah, I would, I'm going to have to agree with you on that. It's in terms of acting also. Uh, mm -hmm. Before I moved to New York, which is where I am right now, I was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they call Chicago the most working city for an actor. Mm -hmm. So I would book commercial, national commercials, you know. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Actually, before I booked my national commercial, I booked a lot of non-union commercials, which were buyouts, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, you could work, just freedom to work, freedom to do whatever you were. That's where I was in my career. As soon as I got the national first national commercial, I was excluded from everything else. So I wasn't working as much. So wow. you're waiting and you're still auditioning for these national spots, mm -hmm. you know, which may or may not happen, but you can't do the non-union work. Right. Right. Yeah. So then you, I mean, like, what are you supposed to do? You continue right. to pay your dues, you continue to pay your dues, but if you're not getting the return from the dues, then it's almost like, what do you, yeah. you know? What am I doing? Why am I right. paying my dues if I'm not working? Mm -hmm. So that becomes the problem. So it just kind of depends on where you are in your career. If you have the agencies or the managers helping you out, or if you, as your business, mm -hmm. are hustling enough to get those jobs, exactly. which is hard without an agent or manager. Right. So it's kind of like a, you know, exactly. catch twenty two. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So. It's something, you know, I again, I entertain, I think, I, you know, from time to time. But, yeah, it's just a non-union that uh, I don't want to give up. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah. What um, you have a couple of spots. I went to your website. You've got some killer spots. You're award winning actor. You did uh, what you do, some a documentary or any. Yeah. Award? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell but, us about um, some of your work. Yeah. So that was. um. Uh, Shaw Rising. It uh, came out in 2020. Um, it was on PBS, and it's about the oldest uh, HBCU in the South, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, Shaw University. And uh, I was approached by uh, the producer of of that program to um, you know read that, and it was great. I mean, it was great working with the producer. The producer brought out the best in me. Uh, with that, that this is script. a perfect example of what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. The producer approached you, right? Absolutely. And if it's a non-union word, this is how you're getting your work. So you continue exactly. to work. So exactly, it's a catch twenty-two. I'm sorry. Absolutely, no problem. Um, yeah, yeah. So I love working on that piece, and and um, you know, so it was like uh, they entered it into um, um, you know the local Emmy, Emmy Awards there, and they won. And I was just like, you know, proud to have been the part of being the voice for that, because uh, it was it won for best uh, historical um, documentary or something like that. And so that was awesome for um, you know 2021. And then I did a um, um, just a promotional piece um, that won I won a Telly Award on, um, and that was that was another um, script where. You know, when I was reading reading through it, I was just like, you know, some some of the scripts that come through, or if it's a book about dealing with 
African American history, or um, I mean, it's just amps me up another level. And when I was reading through that, I was just like, hey, I know instantly how I wanted to read this. And, um, you know, it was one of the biggest compliments I got for doing that. It wasn't just their award, but I re remember, again, one of the um, uh, producers of that piece uh, said to me, you know, Greg, um, you know, uh, it was, they, they called me on the phone and after hearing the read, they said, you know, Greg, I, I'm glad we picked you because I, I don't think I could think of anybody else I, I, else I would want to read that piece. Wow. And that was like one of the biggest compliments I ever got. Because, wow. Uh, and it was, um, um, let me just uh, pull it up here because I'm uh, pulling, forgetting the name of it. Give me one second. Uh, I think it's interesting too, you know, being at a point where, uh, like we said, we can sort of take hopefully somebody gives us some work and mm -hmm. we can look at it and we can one, find the personal connection to it and, or two kind of choose whether or not we feel like we want to do it, mm -hmm. you know? And if you're at that point, I think that's a good place. That's a good place yeah. to be in. That's any voice actor or actor's dream is yeah. to be handed a piece of work and you can say, Oh man, I see this. Okay. I can do this. I can bring this to life. Mm -hmm. I feel a connection to it. Absolutely. It was called the 1954 project. I pulled it up. Okay. And, um, um, you know, that was just, um, just a nonprofit company out of Chicago and they, um, the gist of it was dealing with, um, a lot of African-American teachers back in, you know, during the civil rights movement lost their jobs when integration hit. Mm. And so, um, what this company is trying to do now is, um, you know, educate people about that um, and also explain to people that, you know, Black children do very well um, starting, you know, if they have an influence, influential Black teacher, they're unlikely to, um, you know, drop out of high school and pursue, um, you know, going to college and that sort of thing. And so when I was reading that, I was just like, you know, this is very good. This is a good message. And I knew how I wanted to read that. It was just really intuitive for me. I just just went went for it and uh, had, you know, one of the things that I send to people when I read is um, I want to make sure I have the correct tone and the pacing. And so that's the first thing when I send out to them, I say, hey, is this the tone and the pace you're looking for? And then they'll say yay or nay. But that's one of the first things that, um, I look for when I'm looking for a piece, this is the pace I want to read this at. Is this okay? If not, you know, tell me no. So, so I have a, a approach of how I want to do that. So, but yeah, and um, working on a, a book of poems, it's it's going to be my first one of those. I'm kind of excited about that. Oh, good. And, tell us about it. Yeah, it's called Poem, uh, Poemhood, Our Black Revival. And um, I'm working with um uh, actress um her name is angela um peen and she um she's in um uh what's the um gotham knights i think it is uh she's appeared in that on uh wb network and uh, she's doing the majority of the uh the piece um you know it's the male and female um, read read for uh, the both of us but I'm um, working with her and it, it's a combination of old poetry from, you know, James Baldwin, Nicky mm, Giovanni. I like that. Um, you I know, like and it. then new poets as well, like Roderick Minor, um, you know, uh, Danette Smith, uh, to name a few. And so it's, it's a 10 hour book. And uh, um, so it's, it's, I was just excited that I was being uh, chosen to do that because I'd never done poetry before. And um, so it was kind of, I was thinking it was, you know, this is going to be a challenge that I've, I have a, a vision of how I want to read it. And then I read a few lines, I sent it in to the executive producer and she loved it. And I was like, cool. So going forward to that, that that's going to be out in uh, January. I just sent over the last um, information, you know, the what I read uh, for editing. Mm -hmm. um yesterday so um so i'm excited excited about that 
That's great. I love that. Is it so? Do you have a studio set in your house, and or yep. and how yep. do you how yeah, do you record? Talking, what do you, what consist of for yeah, you? Yeah, I'm um, talking to you. You know, right now from it. Um, so yeah, it's in it's in. I thought you were on, I thought you were on a resort somewhere because I see that. <laughs> <laughs> I see the fancy uh, uh, couch in the ocean. <laughs> in the ocean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm in it right now, and uh, it's my own home studio, so I kind of put together myself a, a room in my home, and uh, it's perfect for it, and it's not too small, not too big, and um, I've done everything in here, and um, so yeah, um, I, you know, it's one of the things I'm going for in the future is um, I'm looking to branch out into coaching and um, also looking to work with uh, authors on like there's a lot of authors and you may know this as well a lot of times authors want to do their own audiobooks we don't recommend that mm -hmm. but you know i'm they don't many of them don't know how to get on the platforms to get their book distributed and so and there's this kind of a a little bit of a disconnect between voice actors and authors because um, a lot of times people, they don't know, you know, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into doing an audio book and people don't realize that your book, it could be eight hours and nine hours long. And, but it's almost that time period in, in editing as well. Right. So it's not yeah. just reading the book, you know, understand that. Yeah. It's, it's, and so sometimes authors think, well, you know, just you're reading the book. But no, you're acting out characters, voice inflection, I know, tone, all that. And you're editing as you go. There's now tools to make it easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a um, uh, positron that's come out that's just awesome. I mean, you can upload your um, your voice and you can upload the script and it goes through it and tells, you know, where words are mispronounced. That is beautiful. That's wow, cutting, yeah. cutting down so much time. <laughs> that was like, I mean, that is really a big, big, big uh, improvement. And then you have punch and roll where, it, you know, you put your cursor where you last made your mistake. You um, rewind and then you start talking again. So you kind of edit the book as you go. Oh, but, wow. but, you know, yeah, I mean, that's something I'm really working on right now. Something to kind of... Uh, help authors with um, being able to get on platforms, uh, coaching them on if they want to do their own book, I don't recommend it, but you know, but there's so many ways that they can go out and distribute, um, you know, their books. Their own work. Yeah. yeah. So that's what, just want to kind of bridge that relationship, uh, make it a little bit better. That's good. What would you, what kind of advice would you give to someone who was thinking about broadcasting, say, you know, a little black boy, a little person of color, anybody in general who's thinking about going into this business and may not see us, may not see you, um, where do they go? Where do they start? Well, what do you say? From the time that, you know, I was working in, you, you mean like, you know, working in sports or working in, as a reporter, um, that industry has really changed a lot in the last 30 years. Um, you know, when I started out, I actually got my foot in the door as a camera person, as a photographer. Mm. Cameraman. And so uh, my local um, station there, Flint, um, I was interning there and got in good with the sports guy and uh, the news anchor at the time. And um, they, you know, hired me on as a, as an intern first and then part-time as a camera person. So I had to learn how to shoot, go out and shoot sports, shoot, you know, Friday night football, shoot uh, basketball, local basketball, hockey. Um, and I love that, uh, you know, really, um, you know, when I was in college, I really didn't do any camera work. I did, you know, journalism and did, had a broadcast class, but we didn't touch cameras that much not like that. And so it was kind of on the job training. You know, if you're young, you're single, <laughs> you know, it's something mm. that you're going to move a lot. And so be prepared for that. Um, so but if you like writing, that's one of the big things with, um, you know, it's always stress, being able to write well. Um, 
because there's fewer jobs, you know, in that industry um, because of technology. Um, so just kind of factor that in. I just want to be honest if uh, somebody's looking to get into it. The, the pay is low, especially if you have to go to um, a small market. Because when that time, when I was working, my market in Flint was market 65. And so I wasn't given a shot at first to get on the sports desk. I mean, I did some fill-in. That's how I was able to get a resume mm, tape together. Okay. And everybody was telling me, well, you can need to go to, um, you know, um, Lubbock, Texas. There was a market 100 and something or, you know, another market up north in Michigan. And I didn't do that. I hung in there. I put together a good tape. And then um, uh, I met. What happened was, it's really in any job, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I had to say that a million yeah. times. Absolutely. <clears throat> it really is. It's, absolutely. It, this is how I was able to make the leap. I mean, because I was at that station for four years. Mm -hmm. I did get on the anchor desk. I did do, um, you know, reporting, producing. But one of the reporters there at the station uh, was dating um, a producer in Tampa. And she came up um, and to visit him. And he was doing a sweeps piece with, you know, in television was, you know, you would put your best programs on during sweeps because everybody's watching. And it was on apartment discrimination. And her and I posed as an interracial couple. And... Um, First place we went to, they were very nice. The second place we got discriminated <laughs> again. And so, um, um, and so that's how I met her. And she took a job as an executive producer at the station in Tampa, the new station that was starting up, the startup station, told her GM about me. And um, they were looking for anchor. I didn't get the job at the time because it went to a former Tampa Bay Buccaneer, the late Dave Logan, who... I was friends with a great, great guy. And um, and then they were hiring another sports reporter producer position where I reported three days and produced two days. And they called me again. They had already, they flew me down for the interview in July of that year. Mm -hmm. They get the job and then they flew, uh, they, they brought up this another position in February of that next year. That's how I got my job. That's how wow. I got my job. Example. So it's not what you know so, sometimes, it's who you know. It's who you know. It's also, you know, like you said, it's it's getting a little experience about everything, like yep. starting out, get some experience here, get some experience here, Absolutely. know your writing. And I know the times are changing, people depending on AI for all this stuff too, but yep. you still have to know how to write. You still have to know exactly. how to, you know, execute, even if AI does a majority of the work, you still have to know mm -hmm. the logistics of everything first. Exactly. And then building relationships, like you said, with people yep. along the way, because mm -hmm. those people are the ones who are going to put you in a position where, you know, you can, you can be successful and you can continue on. So it's building mm -hmm. relationships exactly. along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, so it's been a good long journey and, uh, you know, I really have enjoyed it. There's a lot of, you know, I worked, um, um, morning radio, um, with uh, um, and that was that was a, a totally different experience, and that was really um, I was introduced by someone in that as well because um, I, I worked with it was called the Olivia Fox Morning Show. She had a um, a show. She came down from D.C. came to Tampa, and um, and I did news and sports uh, for them, and um, you know, and it was you know, morning shows, just a lot of fun and acting up and acting silly as well. And so I've done quite a bit in this industry and um, had a good time with it. I like that. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, Thank you. Aside from the book, anything else you want us to know? You have just continuing on? Yeah, doing, yeah. Like, you know, I mean, just uh, continuing on. Um, like I said, I want to branch out to other things you know i'm looking at coaching so um i'm going to put some information on my website regarding that and that's uh www.gregcvoiceovers.com if you want to take a look at that because i'm looking to you know coach people that's looking to go into the industry 
uh, of voiceovers that they just want this as full-time gig or side hustle. It's it's great in that aspect as well. Um, so a lot of people still have their main jobs. I know someone who's a nurse and she does voiceovers um, because she's very good at all, all those technical terms, you know, the medical terms. And so, so she gets a lot of work because she has a nice voice and able to, you know, speak well with those terms because there's a lot of, there's a market for that. Absolutely. That's beautiful. We all need a side hustle, especially us New Yorkers. Yeah, we all need a side hustle. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Greg, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming to One Mike Night. Everybody, no make sure you check out and follow him on social media. His links are on his website. It's gregcvoiceovers.com. Please come back anytime. Absolutely. Everybody watching, follow him and make sure you check out my store, Azule's EN. There's artwork coming soon from the artist Ennio Polanco. You can also get the mugs and t-shirts you already know. Slide into my DMs. It's Marcos Luis, M-A-R-C-O-S-L-E-Y-S. The show is One Mike Night, O-N-E-M-I-C-N-I-T-E. Check out the audio podcast and make sure you tune in every Tuesday on YouTube and watch, jump in the live chat with everybody, talk about the episodes. We'll see you next time. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.